Upon discovering the contrast among Japan's islands and the remarkable marriage between tradition and modernity, the traveler will experience a passionate journey to the archipelago. In addition to historical cities such as Kyoto, visiting the western part of Japan likens to a dive into the heart of a civilization over a thousand years old and whose lifestyle and spirituality has fully preserved their originality and authenticity. With its luxuriant nature that rests and vibrates to the rhythm of a seismic activity among the most important on our planet, Japan just can't be summarized in a few lines. It must be experienced in stages that will gradually reveal all its riches and diversity. When arriving through the Kii Peninsula, the visitor discovers an eternal Japan that meets the traditional image that most Japanese enjoy displaying. On this peninsula, the density of the forest is only equaled by the fervor of the pilgrims who cross them. When following these thousand-year-old paths, the traveler will uncover the roots of a spirituality that blends the cult of nature and ancient beliefs. For the Japanese, the mountain region of Ki is a sacred area where the divinities reside. Several sanctuaries are scattered throughout these mountains. Since the Middle Ages, they have been the destination of pilgrims. At first, this pilgrimage was only undertaken by members of the nobility, but with time, it became increasingly popular among the population and the ascetics. Today, there are very few pilgrims that complete the entire journey. There are several temples here, among them Sansei Gantiji. It is entirely built in wood and mingles in perfect harmony with the neighboring waterfalls. Although a place of prayer, no formal rituals prevail here. The Nachi waterfall is one of the highest in Japan. Waterfalls are the object of a real cult. They are believed to be a Shinto divinity. Waterfalls may reach 133 meters, but that doesn't prevent the monks from climbing to the top twice a year to hang white ribbons. These are supposed to attract the mercy favors of the divinity. No one else has the right or the power to approach the waterfall that closely. The Hayatama Temple in Kumano is also very unusual. It was built over 2,000 years ago as a place of worship to three divinities from the mountains. As in all Shinto temples, prior to entering you must purify yourself at the water fountain. This temple happens to be the first to have incorporated old Shinto and Japanese Buddhism, thus creating the ancient religion of Shugendo. The resulting movement was a major influence in religious life in Japan. It is known under the term Kumago Gongen. Appearances can be deceptive. These temples are renovated and repainted every 20 to 30 years depending on the donations collected. Therefore, they have withstood time without too much damage. This holy and venerated place is surrounded by nature. Monks look after it with special care, since as they believe, it is a crucial vector for transmitting Kumano Gongen. City dwellers also appreciate this region for its hospitality. These traditional country inns, called Ryokan, are comfortable, they offer the serenity that perfectly matches the forest and the mountains. Japan is located on the junction line of several tectonic plates. This explains why the Key Peninsula is a volcanic area whose intense activity generates numerous warm water springs such as here in Yunomine, the most ancient thermal town of Japan. 
The onsen are traditional baths. The water is often burning hot, yet its virtues have proven to be beneficial. A hot bath is above all a ritual. After having cleaned your body, you slip into the water to relax and let yourself go while enjoying such a peaceful decor. The Ryokan are run by women. They are real hostesses. It is a genuine honor to welcome each client as a special guest. In the evening, a futon or rice straw mattress will be unfolded in the main room. The Ryokan are also the perfect place to savor local specialities prepared with vegetables and condiments that grow in the mountains. The presentation is just as important as the freshness of the various dishes. During the Middle Ages, pilgrims would walk from Kyoto following these paths. They would first head for Koyozan and then the Kumano Shrine. In the small villages near Kumano, each garden sets aside a small parcel of land to grow vegetables and especially green tea. Green tea is the national beverage. Knowledgeable tea lovers have their own manufacturing unit built with old cycle parts. After hours of great efforts and often long days of walking, pilgrims finally arrived at Mount Koyozan, the holy mountain. This ashram was built 12 centuries ago. At the time it welcomed disciplines of Shingon, an esoteric branch of Buddhism. Shingon was found by the great Kukai upon his return from China. Today he is revered as Kodo Daishi. The river that flows through Koyazan caused devastating floods at the end of the last century. The authorities simply decided to move several temples located on the riverbanks a few hundred meters above the unpredictable river. Their thatched roofs made them vulnerable to the fire arrows used during the wars or the confrontations among shoguns, the lords of war. Prior to ringing the small bell, the custom requires depositing an offering in the box just under it. In fact, the sound of the bell warns the divinities that a worshipper has arrived so they can hear his prayer and wishes. In one wing of the temple, a young couple prepares the traditional religious wedding ceremony. First, the priest has to drive away evil spirits. Today, only members of an elite can afford a traditional wedding since they have the means to finance the magnificent kimonos and also rent the services of a temple. The San San Kudo ceremony consists in pouring a drop of sake in three little bowls that the future couple will share. 
The first pole symbolizes the feeling of gratitude towards their ancestors. The second confirms the oath between the newlyweds. The last basically has to do with fertility. The family is then invited to participate in sharing the bowls of sake. Beyond the mountains, Koyazan is a very special setting. An everlasting spirituality permeates the site as it does over the entire peninsula. This is the Renge Join Temple, directed by a Zen monk, who, as many others, has built guest rooms called the Shukobu in order for pilgrims or visitors to share part of their spiritual life there. The curves drawn on the fine gravel reveal the perfect command and precision that only few Japanese Zen masters still have. The meditation room stands in the center of the temple. In the morning and in the evening, the monks recite mantras, followed by long periods of meditation without moving, which the guests of the Shukubu may attend. Among the city's numerous shukubu, a rivalry has even started to attract clients by offering high-quality rooms and meals, thus indirectly financing the spiritual life of the temple. The agitated history of Koyazan was marked by the rivalry between shoguns as well as religious wars. During the 16th century, there were approximately 1,500 monasteries and thousands of monks there. After the bloody confrontations between Shingon and Buddhism followers, there presently only remains roughly 110 temples and some thousand monks. Koyazan has nevertheless remained a dynamic center of Japanese Buddhism. Koyazan hosts numerous religious celebrations. Today, monks are heading for the Kondo Temple. Children who are the symbols of purity are going with them to a ceremony for peace. The monks have decorated stickers in their golden baskets, which they are offering as lucky charms. Today also happens to be Mother's Day. Several temples displaying either a Shintoist or Buddhist façade face each other only separated by a few meters, yet they linger here undisturbed. 
Koyazan has remained the major site of the Shingon school, in charge of almost 4,000 temples and more than 10 million faithful throughout Japan. Koyazan also attracts visitors for its amazingly large cemetery called the Okunoin. It is nestled in a forest among hundred-year-old trees that are carefully taken care of. This site is the grave of Koyazan's founder, Kobodaishi. Yet, according to Shingon worshippers, he has not died. He is simply resting and meditating in his tomb while awaiting the arrival of Miroku, the Buddha of the future. These monks have prepared a meal for him which they bring him every day to support him during his meditation. His tomb is located higher up in a protected site only accessible to worshippers. Further down, visitors lightly sprinkle water on several images of the god Jizu, the protector of children. This gesture also symbolizes an offering to the dead so that their soul may rest in peace. During the 11th century, a custom spread among the members of the nobility. Whenever a relative died, they would leave hair or ashes near Koboi Daishi's tomb, hoping he would not forget them upon wakening. Lords, samurais, poets, or even simple people all wanted to rest near the grave. And century after century, this resting place has become immense. In its most ancient part, the diameter and size of the trees substantiate the age of these steles. Pilgrims consider it a duty to walk down all the paths. This tombstone is one of the oldest of the park. It was built in 1627. At the other end of the park, the Okunoin has continued to expand during the modern era. The main companies of Japan all have a stone or stele here, the size of which is in proportion to the magnitude of their activity. All the Shingon temples of Koyazan are run by the Kongbuji from this majestic temple. This is where their spiritual leader lives. Beginning in the 12th century, Kobo Daishi's successors directed the monasteries from this edifice that luckily survived the successive revolutions that account for Koyazan's chaotic history. Koyazan has numerous sites laden with history. The visitor must venture a little higher up to discover these two mausoleums devoted to shoguns. With its gold, silver and exquisitely chiseled wood, this place is also nestled near the forest in near absolute quietness. This 
A monk blesses the meticulous copy of sacred texts. In Japan, various forms are used to express the art of calligraphy. Soft tip felt pens may have replaced the traditional paintbrushes, but this art still requires the same precision and the same concentration. Nara was the very first capital of Japan. The advent of the first emperors may have started during the third century, yet the preeminence of Nara only began in 710 and lasted less than 75 years. It was then replaced by Kyoto. In the Nara Koen Park, deer have become one of the city's symbols. Deer are very tame and highly respected by the population. They believe deer are messengers of the gods prior to the advent of Buddhism. In the park stand several remarkable buildings, such as the imposing Todaiji Temple, the largest wooden structure in the world. One of the buildings accommodates a colossal statue of Buddha. A path lined with lanterns going slightly further up the hill will lead you up to small sanctuaries. The holy deer enjoy the amazing calmness that surrounds this place. Overlooking the city, the Nigatsu-do is one of its exceptional buildings. Built in 752 by a priest, Jishu, this majestic building is made entirely of wood and was rebuilt in 1667 after a fire destroyed it. At the other end of the park, the Kasuga is a sanctuary that perfectly blends into the surrounding vegetation. It was founded in the 8th century by a famous family. It has become a Shinto religious site. Nara's period of splendor may have been short, yet it enjoyed an intense process during which ideas and concepts from China were appropriated. They laid the foundations of Japanese civilization and culture. Osaka is the transit city of central Japan and the mandatory passage over the Kansai River, especially when heading west. Osaka has always been a major harbor and a center of commerce. It has also had the honor once of being the capital of Japan. Two major rivers, the Dojima and the Tozabori, divide the city with the business district to the north and the entertainment district to the south. Arriving by boat still remains the best way to discover Osaka. The city was totally destroyed by bombs during World War II. Today, Osaka is famous for its state-of-the-art electronic innovations and high technology. As from the age of three, Master Akihiro Yamamoto started to learn the subtleties of no theater. In this theater, the no gakudo, he shows us an amazing treasure, masks that are 250 to 300 years old, that he can animate by slightly bending his head when wearing them. Some masks express different phases of a man's life. Others represent the spirits or even the devil. After a very long preparation, and with the help of two assistants, Master Yamamoto goes on stage to play a passage of Hagaromo. Near the theater, the confrontation with modernity of an exciting city can be brutal. 
The city is covered with advertising and students here brave all eccentricities prior to wisely entering their professional life. One has to be Japanese to appreciate the loud noise of the pachinko, a vertical pinball machine, so to speak, where the iron balls are shifted in the hope of winning a prize. The heart of the city is strictly for pedestrians. In an attempt to confine vehicles to the outer limits of the city, the Japanese have developed a remarkable railway and metropolitan network. The Dontobori district is a show in itself. With space in major Japanese cities becoming a luxury, the bicycle has logically replaced the car. Nearby Osaka, Kyoto is the most important of the ancient capitals, especially in the heart of the Japanese, who remain dearly attached to the city. Kyoto has always played a major role in protecting Japan's traditional culture and was the setting of most of the archipelago's major historical events. Such as its predecessor, Nara, the city was built using a checkered pattern modeled after the Chinese capital of the Tang Dynasty. With its numerous temples nestled in sculpted gardens, Kyoto is also a perfect reference for the Westerner whenever he imagines Japan. Early in May, Kyoto is overcome by an intense activity called the Golden Week. Here, Japanese travel and visit their families. The following week, schoolchildren take over and become acquainted with the history of their country in an area where it was largely forged. Gyumizu, the Temple of the Holy Water, is besieged by classes of students who somehow never forget to take pictures as a souvenir. Whatever their age, visitors must purify themselves at the fountain prior to entering the temple. Founded in 798, it is one of Kyoto's oldest buildings. The Hondo, or main temple, hangs suspended above the vegetation. At the foot of the Hondo, the Otawa no Taki spring attracts everyone's attention. The water tumbles down in three separate falls. The one on the right gives intelligence, the middle one beauty, the one on the left long life. Further south of Kyoto, the Fushimi temple is devoted to Inari, the goddess of cereals and particularly of rice. She is associated with wealth and symbolized by a fox. This secretive animal with mysterious powers is the messenger of the princess. This Shinto sanctuary is especially famous for the hundreds of red tori, or gates, that line a path leading to the top of Mount Inari. In the past, the tori were built to favor plentiful rice harvests. Today, they are bought by private individuals or companies seeking good fortune. Thus, they often bear the name of their donators as well as the year they are built. It is said that more than 10,000 of them line this path. In the center of the city, the Nijo Castle was built by the Shogun Leazu in 1603. The exterior of the buildings, the decoration and the woodwork make it a perfect example of Edo architecture. The gardens around the castle are the work of Kobori Enshi, who at the time was considered as a master of gardens. Due to its surface and impressive proportions, experts have qualified it as representing the Shoin Zukuri style. Visiting the market in the Gion district is a mandatory detour for the traveler who wishes to discover the ingredients of Japanese gastronomy. Very diplomatically, the Japanese explain that there's more to their cuisine than a few pieces of sushi. Fish is often used, but countless other recipes exist to prepare it. 
the diversity of vegetables is also amazing. They are part of the ingredients needed for the obanzai, the name used in Kyoto for these dishes. They require long preparation and cooking times that measure up to the result. Seasoning is used in great quantities, notably of algae and mushrooms. The food is rarely very spicy or hot. The yin and yang, the sweet and salty, may nevertheless surprise a few yet novice palates. Green tea is of course served during most meals. Kyoto's green tea is slightly roasted. In the narrow streets of Gion, one tries to protect the traditional houses from pressures of real estate. The kimono has almost disappeared from daily life. Yet, whenever they visit Kyoto, the young mainly wear it as an allusion to tradition. On the other hand, the Mayuko or geisha trainees maintain the tradition with a haughty kimono demeanor, walking to the rhythm of the getas, their wooden sandals, bearing a most neutral expression on their faces. For a long time now, Fumi Sono has studied all the disciplines required to become the perfect geisha, which include traditional music, dance, and the art of serving tea. During an entire year, we must train. We are not allowed to wear the geisha kimono before that. We only wear ordinary kimonos during that year of training. Fumizono is on her way to work in a famous home of Kyoto, where receptions are given in private salons. the ancient imperial city and head north towards the Sea of Japan. Upon leaving Kyoto, rice fields and a wilder nature unfold in a beautiful landscape. The mountains covered with dense forests only leave little space for villages that spread in the small valleys. Nearing the mountains, the ancient village of Miyama has preserved its heritage of minkas, thatched roof houses. Time seems to have stopped here. The locals live to the rhythm of nature, far from the intensity of the large cities, although they're not that far. These traditional roofs are built with reeds and are replaced every 20 to 30 years. The facades exposed to the north are redone more frequently than the ones facing south. The reed is the miscanthus, a rhizome that reaches several meters in height and is abundant in Asia. In one of these thatched cottages, Hiroyuki Shindo perpetuates the ancient art of using indigo to dye fabric or clothes. He is also the president of Kaya, an association whose aim is to preserve the village's heritage. Indigo is extracted from a plant that's been used to make blue dye since the beginning of time. This plant grows in humid and warm regions such as southwestern Japan, especially on the island of Okinawa. More than a mere dyer, Hiroyuki is an artist. He only uses natural compounds in his activity. As he unfolds a yukata, a piece of clothing worn at home, Hiroyuki can be proud of his unique and original creation.
we continue our journey towards the Sea of Japan's coast through Miyazu in the Tango Peninsula, where celebration of spring is in full swing. The purpose of this Shinto ceremony is to purify the houses as well as call for plentiful harvests. The master of the house to whom the wishes are destined is on his doorstep. He congratulates the troop that goes from house to house. The procession can last for several days depending on the number of houses being honored. Amano Hashidate is an exceptional place where the sea has created spectacular lagoons. More than 8,000 pine trees stand on this narrow strip of land that stretches over three and a half kilometers. Some of the trees belong to the rarest species of Japan. The city is divided into two parts, located at the extremities of the sandbar, each with its own temple. On the northern side, you have the Temple of Wisdom. This bay has become famous for the crabs and other seafood that one savors at the end of winter. Let us not forget that fish is used to make sashimi. To the south of the sandbar, a Shinto temple attracts numerous pilgrims. As elsewhere in Japan, thanks to donations, the buildings are regularly rebuilt every 20 to 30 years. This temple was built with cedar wood that amazingly withstood the violent earthquake that occurred in 1928. The Japanese truly enjoy this kind of place that's wonderfully taken care of. The chairlift will carry visitors up to the hill to enjoy the spectacular panorama of the bays and lagoons that spread beyond Wakasa. By following this indented coast, we arrive on the Tango Hanta Peninsula, where the village of Ine is remarkably well preserved in its green setting. Surrounded by thick forests, this fisherman's town with houses on stilts, the Funayas, is famous for its exceptional tuna and famous crabs from the Sea of Japan. Most boats are equipped with lanterns to fish at night. The inhabitants of this little paradise begin to welcome visitors in their funayas transformed into guest houses. They, however, remain vigilant in preserving their peacefulness of where they live. Our journey goes westwards. The coast becomes intensely sculpted by the sea and its dreadful cyclonic storms. For now, calmness surrounds the rice fields, where people work peacefully. People believe here that cultivating rice in Japan goes back 2,500 years. Rice still covers 40% of the cultivated land, yet its consumption is clearly decreasing due to the invasion of more and more westernized foods. Upon reaching the magnificent beach of Hotohikihama, we meet Mr. Uno, the director of the Nakasuna Museum. He is impatient to reveal the secrets of this place. This melodious sound comes from sand grains rubbing against each other there of silica and crystal.
Further west, Kinosaki Onsen draws us even more into traditional Japan. This village is famous throughout the entire archipelago for its impressive number of onsen, the warm water springs whose benefits are so plentiful. It has become a greatly appreciated thermal center. With the Maruyama River flowing into the Sea of Japan, this place is of great symbolic strength. These onsen owe their reputation to the poets and artists from the beginning of the last century. Upon leaving the train station, the mood is immediately set. Geitas or wooden sandals are made available. Guests go from one bath to the next. They come to relax their feet after a long walk in this public and open air bath. Every morning at 6.30 a.m., a strange ballet begins in the center of Kinosaki. As soon as they wake up, visitors put on their yukata, the kimono worn at home, and head for the various onsen to have the privilege to be the first to bathe. This passion touches just about every age group. The must is to visit several baths in the same day. To be among the first does allow the visitor to enjoy the baths quietly. That is if you can stand water that may reach 45 or 50 degrees Celsius and flow directly from the mountain. After this first series of baths, women enjoy getting together around a fountain of burning hot water to cook a boiled egg. We leave the northern coast of Japan for the southern coast and Hiroshima on the EOC as the Pacific Ocean has been baptized here. Hiroshima will remain the first city in the world to have been devastated by the atomic bomb on August 6, 1945. As soon as 1955, with the creation of the Peace Memorial, the city wished to show the entire world what exactly happened and to dynamically campaign for the abolition of nuclear weapons. The cenotaph lists the names of all the victims and carries the following epitaph, rest in peace, for the error shall not be repeated. In line with the cenotaph, the Genbaku Dome was closest to the impact, yet it also was the only building that was not demolished, and it was left untouched to be used as a memorial for the victims. On the other side of the park, the Children's Peace Monument welcomes on a daily basis entire classes that come here to meditate and offer orizuru, the traditional folded paper cranes, to the memory of Sadako. This ten-year-old girl was diagnosed with leukemia following the radiation. With her symbolic folded crane, she launched the Children's Peace Movement. In a quieter place, the Hibakusha, survivors of the cataclysm, tell children what they went through as a duty, so it will never happen again. In the first days following the bomb, the inhabitants showed exemplary courage by undertaking the patient reconstruction of their city in utmost desolation. Today, Hiroshima counts more than one million inhabitants and is a major economic center of the Shikoku region.
Hiroshima may still be marked by its past, but it's also resolutely turned towards the future with a creativity intensified by such a painful history. Among these numerous culinary specialities of the region, the okonomiyaki outdo them all. These popular and easy-to-eat flat cakes are prepared in front of clients around giant burners. They are made with rice, toppled with many layers of vegetables, some egg or seafood, according to taste. Browning them gold and crispy on both sides adds to the final touch. On the other side of the bay, Miyajima Island is a mandatory destination when leaving Hiroshima. The alluvia associated to a regular current make for the happiness of oyster farmers as they are a speciality of the area. Leaving the oyster parks one sees a tori, a floating symbol of the Itsukushima Sanctuary. This is one of the only temples in Japan that stands in water as the tides ebb and flow. Founded in the 6th century, its structure can be explained by the fact that people were not allowed to set their feet on the sacred island and they had to accede to the Tori by a boat. It is devoted to the personalities of Shinto mythology. Using side roads, we reach a path that meanders between images of Buddha and leads to the Daisho Inn, the main residence of monks belonging to the Omuru branch of Shintoism. The main pagoda has a beautiful wooden porch with beams chiseled in the shape of a dragon. The entire sanctuary of the island was run from here in matters regarding the rituals. Around each pavilion, very pretty gardens spread. Water is always present along the statues of monks. We have reached Kyushu, the last large island of the Japanese archipelago. For the Japanese, it's the most westerly, whereas the foreigner would be tempted to say it is the most southerly. In this rural region, wheat fields alternate with rice paddies. Here, the climate is already more humid and warmer. Kumamoto is one of the main cities of the island. As elsewhere in Japan, it has been successful in synthesizing modernity and past history. The castle of Kumamoto is only 400 years old, which is relatively recent, given the span of Japan's existence. But with its massive and imposing walls, it belongs to the three most important castles of the archipelago. The charm of this island is due to the volcanic region that gives shelter to beautiful green tea plantations on its flanks. Koji Nagata is inspecting his field. It is picking time and some of his tea plants remain protected from the sun with a tarpaulin so the heads will reach maturity without being burnt. The day before, it rained a lot and Koli, who cultivates Tama Ryokusha, doesn't want to make a mistake. He will only pick the young shoots at the top of the bushes. His small factory lies several hundred meters from the fields. Green tea requires intensive care and precision, and especially during the roasting phase, which gives off a particular fragrance. Since his business is so small, he can produce his tea using ancient techniques. In fact, he practically no longer uses pesticides or other chemical products. Far from the sophisticated ritual of Kyoto, Miho, who helps her husband in the fields, has offered us to taste her tea.
Hot water is first poured in the saucepan to cool off. She says, to best serve good quality teas, you must never pour boiling water because it will cook the tea and then it becomes bitter. You must let the water cool off in a kettle down to 70 degrees Celsius before pouring it on the leaves. The taste of the royal kusha is smooth, with a pronounced aroma, a far cry from the industrial tea bags. A few kilometers from the Nagata family, heading towards the slopes of the Aso volcano, an amazing landscape unfolds. We could believe that we are in the European Alps. The volcanoes build up several massifs with a national park. Further off, Mount Nakadake slowly allows fumes to escape. You can never know what mood it is in until you get close to it. At times, sulfur emanations are too strong. Its access is forbidden. The volcano is still active and its last major eruption happened in 1957. Today it offers us a breathtaking sight. It is on the slopes of the Komazuka volcano that is wisely asleep that our journey in western Japan ends, where the dynamics of the economy have not changed nature and lifestyles that will never cease to seduce us.